All right, so yeah, so the, the idea that we came up with and the thing that we want to propose today is to uh, build a molecular machine that can take um, information as an input in the form of a polymer and then copy that polymer into another one that would be functional. Uh, and so you can see that as a universal constructor. Why is because there is a correspondence between uh, the linear sequence of the functional polymer that's being copied uh, with the actual 3D structure. And so in theory, and that's what biology does, you can encode information in the sequence and then you can place with like at atomic accuracy atoms in space, in 3D space. And so that's what biology uses as a little trick to be able to print things in 3D. And that's very useful because you can build functional materials, you can build many things with that. Um, and so that also requires that you have some computational understanding of the folding process, which now we're starting to get. And so, um, so yeah, so now what we do is that we have this universal constructor again that takes um, a, a tape um, that has information. So it could be like in biology, it could be some nucleic acid. Um, and then takes building blocks and solutions and then polymerizes them into, into, um, into another polymer, which will then fold. Um, yeah, and so what you need is to come up with a way to, to build this. Um, and then what we propose so far is to rely on biological materials like RNA, DNA, and proteins, because not only we understand how they fall, we can manipulate them, but also they'd be useful to build bio biotechnological applications later on. Okay, so the way we propose that I think could work um, is to have a protein-like assembly that could, um, that could bind uh, the tape that you have here. So here it's like a double sequence double um, double strand DNA, but it, it can be also a single strand, it can be another things. Um, and so you have this assembly here that pretty much um, um, scans the, the, the template, and then um, what it does, it's gonna uh, take building blocks, for example, like tRNAs that are loaded with amino acids, and it's gonna catalyze um, a ligation between these building blocks uh, just by using a proximi proximity synthesis. Um, and uh, peptide bond formation using like some simple catalysts. Um, and then and so in, and so in doing that, you have a synthesis of a, a nascent uh, a, a amino acid chain, right? And so the way you push that forward, um, and that's very contrary to what the ribosomes do, is uh, by either degrading the templates or adding, uh, modifying the templates so, so, as that, so as to push the, the machine forward and keep going with, um, uh, template uh, copying. Cool. So, um, so that involves a lot of, of design, um, and that's a little uh, naive maybe, but um, at least from a computational protein design perspective, these are things that are tractable now, so we could design such systems in, in months to years, and we could start you know, making them in vitro, getting some protein expressed, um, doing some structural data to see if they fold, if they bind the DNA templates, um, so that would be kind of like the first uh, midterm check after a year or so of work. Um, then what we have to do is actually see if we can get uh, the catalytic activity that we need to be able to, uh, to do the peptide bond formation. And so that would require a lot of you know, in vitro uh, assays and catalytic assays. Um, then after we're done with that, so we have something that falls that binds DNA and has some catalytic activity, then we can move on to, to try to see if we can actually translate some, um, some simple uh, polymer. Um, and so, so this phase here will go from design to experiments and iterations of that. Um, so we expect that to, to take around like two years, potentially, maybe more. Um, but then like the most difficult part would probably to go further and have something that's efficient at um, uh, reading this information polymer and then synthesizing something that, that can fold in the shape we want. Um, yeah, and then if we have that, then we can move forward to our actual applications. Um, do you guys want to add something to that? Um, and if we would go back to the document very quick. Uh, oh, the document? Yeah, I was just. So yeah, so. Uh, um, is this one, okay, cool, perfect. Um, 
Yeah, so um, um, so yeah, so that's like in theory, you know, like again, like we want to do something that's based on biology, but then we can expand that to have, you know, the novel polymers and other kind of polymer chemistry and, and really try to synthesize things that are completely orthogonal to nature. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, does that work? Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. So again, like, so what kind of technological applications you could think of? You can again, like, present like in space atoms in three D at the very high accuracy. So you can design any kind of biotechnological uh, tools. Um, and you know, l like address a lot of problems that you have in nanoengineering. Um, then you can also think about synthesizing biotherapeutics um, with like much more um, reliable methods that don't rely on cells, um, and so that could be very useful for the industry. Um, and also, so something that I think is extremely interesting for such systems that you can start thinking about um, addressing artificial life uh, synthesis and design. Um, with like a completely bottom up uh, way so you could you could you know get rid of all the complexity of the of the ribosome the way it evolved and and start designing systems that don't require that um, and so yeah that could be very interesting for that um. <laughs> so there's no risks uh, which is pretty convenient uh, uh. Um. <laughs> Little technical prime here. There we go. Ah, here we go. Right. So the the the, the few primes of that thing. So first of all, um, yeah, it might be hard to to like use different polymers, right? It might be hard to get uh, to really kind of fine tune you know, the catalytic activity that we want to to achieve. Um, so that might be very technical. Um, um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, ethical risks. Um, these are a little funny to think about, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so if you could connect, you know, AI with, like, the actual physical world in that way, you could have AI systems that start, like, printing things in 3D, and, and that would be uh, interesting to think about. Um, yeah, and so in terms of like how much would that cost to do such a such a thing, um, it should be actually pretty pretty cheap at this point because these only rely on traditional computational protein design methods and traditional biochemistry. So these are things that we can actually address right now with the technology we have and the resources we have. So that could actually move um, quite fast. Yeah, do you guys want to add anything else? We covered it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Does now. Um, okay, do you want the nice question or the not nice question? I, uh, I'll give you the nice question. Okay, I think, so I can help you out. I think saying that you're going to look at the origin of ribosome when you're already putting information in is false. You can't do that because you've got a circular argument. Mm -hmm. okay? Sure. So otherwise, you're just inventing yourself, which is fine. It happens in Prometheus. Right. It, Ridley Scott really had a good movie there. So my question is, what is the benefit of having unifying all polymer chemistries here? A chemist already does that, and they're a lot less expensive than building this machinery. So how could you, how could you aid the chemist to do mm -hmm. polymerize? So my, I guess I can see something very interesting here that unifies stepwise chemistry and more autonomous polymerization chemistry. Polymerization chemistry, you initiate once, you make millions of bonds, but you don't have any control. Here, potentially, you can have a lot of control. So I can see why it's super interesting. Can you imagine a scenario where you can unify, you know, what, I guess, what monomers, what type of polymer chemistry am I not thinking of you want to go into? Right. That's so a I nice mean, way of putting it. There okay. You 
No, but like, first of all, like, can you print, can, can you synthesize a sequence more than like 100 residues? Yeah. How so? Okay, and you and so and so you get sequences that are more than 100 residues. Yes. With what efficiency? Yeah, with with molecular efficient molecular control. But it's like your your efficiency of the whole process is like. I know. Below 70 percent. The audit's coming out in Nature Chemistry in a couple of months. Okay, sounds good. I would love to see that. But so like you know like the bottleneck right now for like peptide synthesis is that uh, the efficiency of assembly is like you know there's some efficiency, right? So every time you add a building block, then the whole. If the you use solid phase sure. approach, then you can make it really efficient. And if you use a cascade... Well, sure, but it depends what you mean by very efficient. But wait, you're not, why are you asking me the question? I'm asking you the question. No, no, I think it's interesting, <laughs> but... Uh, it's a, um. But it's cool. Okay, well, to be discussed further, Ayusman, you had a question. I actually have a comment, and, and that is that the burn bridge chem, uh, concept is actually useful in biological systems. It's it's believed that influence of viruses, they roll around the cell surface finding binding spots, and they do that by this burn bridge chemistry. Right. And this is showed by a college Salita at Emory, that you can take an RNAs and you can have it walk down an RNA by the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems I've got the microphone. Um, to make this work, what catalytic functions do you need and how do they have to be coordinated and how right. are you going to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. So you, so like peptide bond formation happens spontaneously, right? As you, if you can use like just like proximity based um, to get like peptide bond formation. So you can, you can like, of course, like activate it by doing some simple catalysis, right? You can just add like just a, like a simple cysteine or something like that and, and increase the rate of formation. Well, I mean, you know, it's definitely like one of the biggest challenge. Um. So um, the, the ribosome is actually a terrible enzyme. It's like one cycle per second sort right. of thing. Um, it, what, what I really like about any kind of idea like this is to be able to make a molecule where I've got a piece of DNA attached to it so I can then make huge libraries of them and then screen them by amplifying the DNA and sequencing it. So if you could burn the bridge, but not quite burn it off, so I could st we could still sequence the DNA, that would be really cool. Right. I'd just throw that in there. Yeah. This is a cool idea, Alexis. Apologies if I'm missing something, uh, but what's the advantage of this universal constructor approach over simply just modifying like tRNAs to uh, be compatible with non-biological materials? Um. So sorry, I'm not sure. So what, sorry, what do you mean? I, why design a new um, codon recognition molecule when you can just use the ribosome and then modify it? Oh, device? yeah, sure. So like the ribosome is made of like, you know, 200 components. Yeah. So if you wanted to use it, transfer it, you know, make something that's orthogonal. You, you, so like the complexity of a ri the ribosome is, is almost irreducible, right? So, yeah, yeah. So the first thing you, want, you would like to do to be able to have a simple machine that can achieve the same is to, to start from scratch, in a way. Ah, sure. Sure. <laughs> All I right. mean, that's, that's one of them. I mean, there's many different yeah, reasons why that's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.